I've been saving this story for a special occasion, and today I received some awesome news that would definitely apply. The man that stalked me for over two years has just been denied parole, and I couldn't be happier. What follows is a very condensed version of the hell he put me through during those years. My marriage had recently fallen apart after four years, and I moved to a new town to make a fresh start. I quickly found a job tending bar at one of the many dive bars around town. The customer pool covered a wider range of folks. Everything from college students to bikers filled the rosters of regulars. Within my first month, I'd made friends with a very nice couple. They ran an area horse rescue service from their ranch. I had mentioned a desire to learn how to ride a horse and the wife offered her services. We got along well and sometimes spent girls nights out hopping bar to bar, flirting with men. On an especially wild night, she introduced me to an ex-employee of hers. He and I spent the night together and that was where it should have ended. I was able to easily move on with my life, but he would not be. Three times in the following weeks, I received roses from a secret admirer. What was at first a romantic gesture would soon turn horribly sour when I was contacted by my admirer. After being asked if I had gotten my roses and telling him yes, he informed me that since he'd spent so much money on flowers for me, I was expected to repay him. I was shocked when he said this. I had initially been a little wooed by the flowers. If he'd asked nicely, he may have gotten a date out of it. What happened during the course of that date could have went anywhere, but... The fact that he expected intimacy because he'd spent money on me like I was some sort of streetwalker made me disgusted. I didn't hesitate to tell him so. His opinion was that I was a tease and had been leading him on. However, considering I'd not seen or spoken to him in weeks, I still don't see how he got that idea. Once, I told him to F off and hung up the phone. I never expected to hear from him again, but I was terribly wrong. A week or two later, I was out on a girls' night with my friend and we ran into him. He was drunk as a skunk and must have thought I'd forgotten what he'd said to me. I hadn't, of course, and told him off to his face. All this did was make him more aggressive, and after he grabbed my butt, I told one of the bouncers I knew and he kicked him out immediately. I could hear him cursing me his whole way out the door. I had luckily thought ahead and asked the same bouncer to walk us to my car when we left the bar a little while later. I had been suspicious that he may have been waiting for us when we left, and it turned out to be right. As we approached my car, I saw him waiting for me. My bouncer friend knocked him around some, and this gave us enough time to get away. My friend told me later on that night why her and her husband had to fire him. Apparently he would show up to work drunk sometimes and come on to her and give her husband an attitude. Once he'd done this the third time, they had had enough and cut him loose. Now all the trouble I was having seemed to make a lot more sense. As we moved forward through the next year, I had several encounters with him around town. One particular rough instance was when he showed up at my house slobbering drunk and crying for me to take him back. I tried to explain to him that we had never been together in the first place. No one I know would think of a one night stand as a relationship, but he must have. I had to call the cops to get him to leave, but I had no idea it would get much worse. I had been doing my best to avoid running into him, and I know for sure it had to have been almost two months since I'd seen or heard from him. My new boyfriend and I had about six months together and we were hanging around my place watching TV or something. We'd been out to dinner earlier that night and had only been back about an hour when a loud banging started at the front door. It only took a few bangs before it flew open, taking the frame with it. We'd both been caught off guard and were standing in the open like dummies when the culprit entered the house. It was my stalker and he was drunk, but he was also armed with a pistol. The moment he saw my boyfriend, he started shooting. My boyfriend knew it was coming and had began running when he was hit by the first shot. I'm not sure what had happened after that first shot because I started running too. By the time I made it to the bathroom and locked the door, I'd counted at least three more shots. Since I was almost positive that my boyfriend was dead, I was going to do my best to survive. Just by chance, I had my phone in my back pocket. I was dialing 911 even before I'd locked the door. 
Even while I was speaking to the operator, I could hear him yelling curses at me in a slurred voice. I figured he'd started shooting through the door any second, so I laid down in the bathtub, making myself as flat as possible. I can't remember exactly what she was saying to me when the shots began. I was so terrified by this point, I couldn't help but scream. The shooting seemed to go on forever before it stopped. It couldn't have been more than another 30 seconds before I finally heard the policeman yelling at him to drop his gun. Honestly, I wish he hadn't, but he must have had a small shred of sense left. It wasn't much longer until an officer knocked on the door and told me I could come out. The paramedics were already working on my boyfriend. Miraculously, he wasn't just still alive, but he was conscious and talking to them. It looked like the dumb SOB was so drunk he missed all of his vital organs, only managing to hit him twice. They had already taken him away before I exited the bathroom, and I didn't see him again until the trial. It wasn't a long procedure. Once I testified, his lawyer stopped the trial and announced he was going to take the plea deal he was being offered. He'd had several prior offenses, so the 10 to 25 year sentence was getting off light. My boyfriend and I celebrated the good news by getting married, and we've been together for 12 years this May. Since his first parole hearing has went so well, and we shouldn't have to worry about him getting out for another two or so years, I think we're taking an extended vacation to celebrate this time. Wish us luck for the future. I had an unbelievable thing happen to me last year. It was just another run-of-the-mill school year. I was going into my last two semesters before graduation and had my mind focused on my life after school. I guess this is the reason I didn't pick up on what was going on around me for a long while. On an early morning trip into town, not long before the end of the first term, I made a stop to retrieve my shoes from the repair shop. I didn't pay much attention to any of the other shoppers. I paid for and got my shoes and went on with my shopping. While I was heading toward the used bookstore, I just happened to notice a young blonde man walking down the sidewalk on the opposite side of the street. I wasn't sure why he caught my attention, but there was something about him that seemed familiar. Shaking the idea from my mind, I continued on my journey. The selection of the store was lacking, so after browsing a couple of minutes, I headed back to campus. Strangely, I noticed the blonde man standing outside a gas station drinking a soda. What was most likely a coincidence, just another human going about their daily life, made a mark on my mind. Once more, I laughed off my odd feelings and headed home. My house was a small two-bedroom home nestled across from the school. It was in no way odd to see the same students coming and going from class every day. It was, however, more than odd to see the blonde man sitting on the steps of the school that same afternoon. I had been back from my errand several hours and just happened to glance out of my living room window when I noticed him. This coincidence was now starting to become concerning. A third attempt to ignore the situation growing before me had collapsed. Yes, he could have just been another student like myself, going about his day, but seeing him so many times in one day when I couldn't remember seeing him ever before then was causing me to be somewhat worried. Since he wasn't posing any danger to me sitting across the street, I forced myself to forget him and go back to my chores. Later on, when I looked across to the school and noticed his absence, I realized how paranoid I was being and finally put the blonde man out of my mind. His presence wouldn't return until that Monday. I had been walking to class and noticed him again, this time sitting with a group of a few other males talking to each other. After standing for a moment, watching him to see if he looked over to me and never seeing him doing so, I went on to my next class. Even though my focus was important to the class, I couldn't think of anything else but that man. The chance that I was being followed struck me as hilarious at that time. For some unknown reason, the man and I just happened to be in the same place at the same time. This was the only conclusion I could accept, and until the end of the term, a few weeks later, it remained the most logical reason available. During the holiday break one evening, myself and a few other girls were hanging around at my house. Out of the corner of my eye, 
I notice a person sitting across the street on the school steps. To my shock, it was the blonde man. This was the first time I would be unable to retreat to a place of justification in my mind. The school was closed for the break, as were the dorms. No logical excuse for his presence existed. Just to make sure I wasn't losing my mind and seeing someone who wasn't there, I asked one of the girls to come to the window. I asked her if she knew who he was or if she had a name, but she claimed to have never seen him before. She must have seen the concern on my face because she asked me if I was okay. Thinking quickly on my feet, I changed the subject. At this point, I was unsure if my growing fear was justified, and I didn't want to drag someone else into a possibly embarrassing situation. We went back to our other friends and enjoyed the evening festivities, but all along, the unknown blonde man lurked in the back of my mind. Things would go back to normal somewhat until the weeks following the new year when an already strange situation would become an outright farce. On an ordinary Monday morning, I was preparing myself for class when I heard a shuffling on my front porch. Acting before I thought, I threw open the door just in time to see the backside of a blonde-haired male running away from my house. I hadn't even had a moment to process what I was seeing when I witnessed the individual being struck down in traffic. The car that hit him had been going over 50 miles an hour, and he was supposedly killed on impact. For his sake, I hope this was true. The moment police became involved, I had to make the decision as to whether I would mention all the strange things that had occurred leading up to this. Considering I, myself, was unsure about what had been happening, I made the choice to say as little as possible. I simply told them that I saw the man running across the street and get hit. Involving myself any further didn't seem right. After all, I still had no proof that the man was stalking me. Smearing the name of a man I didn't know struck me as a bridge too far. The following afternoon, I made a discovery that would finally put all my doubts to rest forever. Mixed in with the rest of my regular mail was an unmarked, folded piece of white paper. Reading it would provide me with many a sleepless night. It simply stated, I see you every day, and I know you see me. Why do you ignore me? There was no way I could deny what was happening now. The question still remained as to why I was chosen to be the target of his obsession. That answer wouldn't be discovered until the end of the semester. A group of students and I were sitting together and discussing our time in the university when one of the girls, a small and quiet engineering major, mentioned how unfortunate it was that Mark didn't make it the last few months to graduation. What she said next would show me just how self-centered I had become over the last four years. I don't know if you knew it, Lindsay, but he had a major crush on you. You were all he talked about. Isn't it so crazy that the place he was hit wasn't 25 yards from your house? I felt like I had been hit by a truck myself and was unable to speak at first. Yeah, that's crazy. Life is strange like that. I felt like I had been hit by a truck and was unable to speak at first. Yeah. That's crazy. Life is strange like that. This was all I could think to say. Having all this information dumped on my lap so quickly had left me dumbfounded. I excused myself from the group and ran full speed back to my house, locking the door behind me. Her words had brought back a flood of memories I wasn't aware of even existed. I had in fact known the blonde man. He had been in my very first class at the university and been a very kind and friendly person towards me. He had helped me a lot with classwork. However, once I had made it into my sorority, my entire group of friends, including the boys I spoke to and dated, changed drastically. When the class was over, I moved on and left him in the past. We most likely hadn't spoken since my freshman year. Well, I'm not sure if my gradual indifferent behavior toward him caused an innocent crush to degrade into a helpless obsession, or a kind and loving young man was simply attempting to reconnect with a former friend. I've become well aware of how easy it can be to move forward in life and leave those most important to you behind. Not just in life, but also memory.
I feel the need to share a story written from a viewpoint I don't often see here, that of a stalker himself. While I in no way want to give the impression that I believe my actions were in any way excusable, I think it's important for people to know how easily a shy young man's crush can explode into a full-bore obsession and the precise events that caused this to happen, at least in my case. Although now, ten years later after the fact, I am well aware of the terrible things I was doing and thinking, but I want everyone who may hear or read this to know not all those who become stalkers are terrible people. They are simply lost. However, it is ultimately up to them whether they step out from the darkness in time to realize this is where they are dwelling. Please give me a little of your time to explain how badly I strayed and what it took for me to return to my former path. If I'm going to tell this tale properly, I should probably tell you about myself and the person I once was. My early childhood had been a happy one as far as I can recall. Nothing really bad started until I began adolescence and my cute freckles were replaced almost completely by severe acne. With the acne came the seemingly unending bullying and mockery. At that age, no girl, regardless of her heart, wants to be seen with a school pizza face, and he knows this very well. The treatment I would receive for many years following caused me to become a far more introverted and angry young man, where I was once a shy but kind child. My only option at the time appeared to be keeping my head down and trying to make it through each day. Unfortunately, this was rarely the way things panned out. Any kid who was bullied as badly as I was could tell you this is often the way their day-to-day -day life was. It would turn out that as I entered my first year of college, no matter how bitter and jaded I had become, my heart made a choice my mind certainly never would have. I want to stress that although my years at the university were far less offensive, the damage to my self-esteem had already been done. Despite this, I met a girl that stole my heart right away. The iciness of her light blue eyes and smooth porcelain skin were of a beauty I had never beheld, and still have not to this day. We had two classes together that first year and I didn't learn a thing. Every bit of focus was on her, and before long, she became involved in every thought of my day, and often even in my sleep. I would spend my free time beating myself up, telling myself that even if she treated me nicely, she would never want to be with me. My fears were made fact when I finally summed up the courage to ask her on a date. There was a dance being held for freshmen and I had overheard her saying she hadn't been asked to accompany anyone yet. Some foolish notion I had conjured up told me that this was my chance to be with her. The next day between classes, I caught up to her and popped the question. The way in which she shot me down hurt me far more than I expected. At that time, she was walking with a couple of other girls. Their laughing at my question cut me deeply and when she suggested I ask someone else and that she would rather just be friends, well, I'll just say that her words cut me deeply. That night, as I sat in the dark in my dorm room, I cried and cursed myself for being so foolish and cursed her even more. Now that I think back on that night, it was where my obsession with her morphed from what I believed to be love into the early phases of hate. No matter how much I would tell myself that I hated her for what she had done, I knew I still would do anything to be with her, if even just for a moment. From that night on and for a long time after, I would rant to any one of my few friends that would listen about how evil and bad females were, while at the same time, I would follow her around, obsessing about how beautiful she was any time they weren't around. The hypocrisy of what I was doing wasn't lost on me. However, I had already allowed my emotions to drive my actions. Soon, just looking upon her wasn't enough, and I'd taken a step in a very scary direction. One afternoon, I found myself alone in her dorm room. I'd managed to sneak in while everyone was gone to class, and... Because I'd made myself well versed in her and her roommate's coming and goings, I knew I had a good hour to myself. For several minutes, I simply sat on her bed, taking in her surroundings and inhaling her wonderful scent on her sheets. Then I moved on to her drawers, 
pulling each one out in turn and burying my face in the clothing. Time flew by, and when my time was up, I quietly slipped out unseen. A few weeks after that, I took things even further and snuck in while she slept. The sick feeling of nervousness sat heavily in the pit of my stomach as the excitement of it all caused my heart to pound. I sat carefully onto her roommate's bed who was out that night and stared at her beautiful body. Her sleep was fitful and the covers exposed her smooth, soft legs and backside. When I saw this, my heart pounded faster and faster. Terrible thoughts raced through my mind, but I grabbed control of myself and fled from the room before I leapt onto her. I quickly found myself becoming terrified of what I may do to her if I was alone with her again. Many days of battling the monster growing inside me forced to make an important decision that would affect my future. One early morning, I forced myself to go to the college mental health clinic and confess what I had been doing. At least twice I began to turn the doorknob and then stopped. The third time, I succeeded. For the next year or more, I would first attend an inpatient facility and then continue to see a shrink once a week. It took quite a while, but with a combination of time, separation, and counseling, I was able to learn how to deal with my insecurities and obsessions. Ten years have passed since that early morning, and I'm proud of how far I've made it. Obviously, I never returned to the college, and that night in her room was the last time I saw her. While I may still at times find myself thinking back to that time, I no longer feel any draw to her. I'm not sure if she ever knew the danger she was in, but I hope she's doing well and is happy. I've bounced from job to job for some time until I was lucky enough to befriend a man that gave me a job doing IT at a small company. Come this September, I'll be there six years and I'm doing very well. As a matter of fact, I was even able to meet a girl the normal way and get married. We're awaiting the arrival of our first child in the new year and I couldn't be any happier. Looking back at the time and recounting such a terrible period here, I was, at first, unaware of exactly why I was sharing it with you and your listeners. Now that I've had some time to dwell upon it, I guess my goal is twofold. First, I want to give everyone present an idea of how someone can become an obsessed stalker, at least in my case, and how easy it is. Secondly, and most importantly... I want anyone who's reading or hearing this to know that you don't have to listen to what your obsessive mind is telling you. You can prevent yourself from doing something unspeakable and going past an unreturnable line. Not every stalker is a truly evil person. They may have simply lost their way and need a little help returning to the proper path. If you see yourself in the past version of me, don't be afraid to get help. All you have to do is ask. My parents had a wonderful and happy marriage, and because of this, my younger days were great. That all changed, however, when my father was KIA in Iraq in 2005. Since my folks had been high school sweethearts at 16, his loss hit my mom very hard. For a long time, she spent most of her days and nights in bed. Luckily, I was already approaching 14 and capable of taking care of myself. Not one second did I hold her reaction against her. We all deal with the death of a loved one in our own way. Her long days in bed would end about nine months after my dad's death when a friend of my mom convinced her to go out with her to her favorite bar. That day would lead to a long, hard road in which she would almost lose her life and both of our lives would be forever altered. Within a week, my mom would bring home her first boyfriend. He would become the first of many men she would pair with large amounts of alcohol in a vain attempt to kill the pain of my dad's loss. Over time, her personality would change drastically. She became far harder and I can't think of one time in which I remember her smiling. Then the day I feared would come arrived. My mom moved in one of the boyfriends. Daryl was a lowlife that worked days at a motorcycle repair place and spent his nights drinking as much as possible. 
For whatever reason, Mom thought he'd be great marrying material. I guess alcohol does destroy brain cells, just like they say. Anyhow, they got hitched a few months after he moved in, and that's about the time everything started to fall apart. Daryl would show his true self within a week of the marriage. He and Mom stumbled in one night from some bar and began arguing. She said something that made him mad, and he backhanded her across the face. Rather than destroy him that second, she would apologize to him after sobering up the next morning. This was just the reaction he must have been hoping for. The abuse would escalate from that point and it became normal to see mom with a black eye or split lip. Despite my begging, she wouldn't get rid of him. I heard the same excuses over and over. He's only mean when he's drunk and I push him too far when I am. In the end, it's my fault. I eventually gave up and began focusing on saving enough money to get out of the house. Luckily, Daryl ignored me for the most part. He'd said many times that he'd had no interest in being a parent to me, and that was just the way I liked it. Ultimately, the logical result occurred the year after I'd moved out. Daryl and Mom had one of their usual arguments, and this time, he almost took it too far. I would get a call one day at work from the hospital saying my mom had been in a terrible accident. Only when I got there did I find out it was far from an accident. Daryl had beaten Mom so badly that she had died once in the ambulance. A noise complaint from the neighbors was the only thing that saved her. That incident was the one that finally got her to leave him and, with Daryl out of the picture, I moved back in with Mom to help her with the bills. Things were a little rough while Mom healed. Daryl did try to get her to come back to him through text, but she managed to stand fast. Just as it was starting to look as if though she was going to be back on her feet without him, he caught her in a moment of weakness and convinced her to come over just to talk. On her way over, she did the one smart thing that would save her life. That night I was working and received a text from her saying she was heading over to the old house, the one that Daryl was living in. It was clear to me this was a bad idea. Once I managed to fill my boss in on the situation, I raced over to stop her. She was already there when I pulled up outside. As soon as I turned off my engine, I could hear people yelling at each other. I rushed into the house in time to witness my mom jump on Daryl's back. She was punching him on his head, and when he turned around to pull her off, I noticed a big bruise on her face and a bloody lip. It wasn't hard for him to throw her off. She was lying on the floor yelling curses at him. Each word she said was slurred, and this was when I realized she was drunk. Neither of them noticed me at first. They continued yelling at each other. As this happened, I watched Daryl reach into a drawer and pull out a pistol. He fiddled with it for a second and then pointed it at my mom. In her state, she foolishly laughed at him and said that he didn't have the spine to shoot her. A few seconds later, he fired the first shot. The shock of seeing this caused me to scream out and this was when he finally realized I was there. When he saw me, he grinned and aimed the gun back at my mom. There was no way I could let him shoot her again, so I charged and tackled him. As we fell, a second shot went off barely missing her. Fortunately, he was so drunk he had dropped the gun, but once he located it, he began crawling over to get it. I knew when he had it, he'd shoot me next. Out of nowhere, I yelled out that I'd called the cops and that they were on their way. This was a lie, of course. When he heard this, he stopped and stared at me, trying to see if I was telling the truth. I put on my best serious face, and it must have worked. He reached down and grabbed the gun and helped himself to his feet. I winced when he stood up, but instead of shooting me, he turned around and stumbled out the front door. I quickly crawled over to my mom. Miraculously, she was still breathing, however she was bleeding heavily. Dialing 911, I was told by the dispatcher that someone had already called in gunshots and the officers were on their way. No more than three minutes later, they showed up with the paramedics right behind them. They rushed her to the hospital and after a long surgery, she survived. Daryl being drunk was probably the thing that saved her life. At the distance she was, he could have easily blown her brains out. When it comes to Daryl, however, he wasn't quite as lucky. The police caught up with him on his motorcycle a few miles from the house. 
After repeated demands that he drop his gun, he raised it and they emptied their guns into him. The moment I was told was like a load of bricks had been lifted from my shoulders and I relaxed the first time I had in a long time. I can't pretend that his death made me sad because honestly, I'm glad he's gone. Our life had been a nightmare since he came into it. Once mom had recuperated, my parents and I convinced her to enter alcohol treatment. It went very well and she's been sober almost two years as of me writing this. Last month was the first time we visited my dad's grave since the funeral and despite it being a sad day, I think it is a good first step in my mom's grieving process. A process I don't think she's ever managed to complete. However, I believe with a lot of help from myself and the rest of the family, she will be able to finally deal with his loss and learn how to handle it without the booze. I'm a 21 year old female and at the time of the story I was 19 and had just started a new job at a Greek restaurant in my town. I had also just found out I was 6 weeks pregnant and still in the process of comprehending this but ended up losing the pregnancy about 2 weeks after the incident. So needless to say, I was a freaking wreck emotionally already. This new job meant basically waiting tables for about 6-10 to 10 hours a day and for anyone who has ever experienced morning sickness knows that it does not just strike in the morning. So I was pretty nauseated most of the day and exhausted which meant I wasn't exactly the most alert. I was incredibly tired all the time but I tried my best to still appear alert and focused. I woke up bright and early and put on a long sleeve button down, black slacks and no slip shoes. On my first day at this new job I was immediately walked through and introduced to all the other employees. One person in particular stood out immediately. He was probably in his mid-forties to early fifties, overweight, dark, unkempt hair, and beard and glasses, and no smile. He stared like he was trying to direct me with his eyes and seemed to be analyzing every part of me. To this day, it is still something that can send a chill down my spine. I think it is also worth mentioning that because I look younger than I am when I'm not wearing makeup, I was continually being asked what high school I went to. Most of them assumed I was 16 years old and I had never been formally introduced to this guy or even learned his name so as far as he knew, I was 16 years old. I didn't see the point in correcting them since I was pretty used to being mistaken for younger when my arms are covered. Throughout my entire shift I could feel eyes on me no matter where I went in the restaurant and over time I would turn to the kitchen and see his cold, unmoving, deadpan expression locked on me like a heat-seeking missile. For the most part, on the first day, this is all he did. Aside from that, he left me alone, but for me, it was already enough to put me on edge. I would also catch moments where he and my manager would be speaking with one another, look over at me, then speak again. At first I thought, okay, this is just the hormones, I'm probably being crazy. Then towards the end of my shift I let my manager know I would need to leave exactly at closing because I need to walk to my bus stop and if I miss that bus, I'm kinda SOL until the next one comes a little before midnight. He agrees and says it won't be a problem. He also mentions that I am dressed so formally and casual as best. So the next day I decided to just wear the same thing I saw my other female coworkers wear and I come in for my shift. I am wearing all black short sleeve t-shirt, black yoga pants, non-slips, and my apron. I also happen to have multiple tattoos, most of which are on my wrists, forearms, and inner arms. Not a full sleeve, but pretty visible. To most of the co-workers, this was enough to show them I was in fact over 18, but it also made me more interesting of an object to leer at during my shift for him. As I was restocking some of the sauces we put on the table, he approached me and stared me down intently. I looked up, startled to see him so close to me and just said, Yes? He just stared at me for a few seconds and said, Want coffee from me? We had a machine we used to make various coffee drinks that we kept in the back so I assumed this was what he meant and said, Um, okay, sure, thanks. I appreciate that. He seemed really content and just walked away without another word. 
It never actually brings me any coffee, and I think this is kind of weird, but just go back to doing my job. A few hours later, and it's finally time I can take my lunch break, so I quickly place my to-go order and run to the bathroom to change into a sweater. When I come back from changing, my food is ready, and he hands me the food, and I notice that there is a piece of paper on top, and that he is smirking at me, then looking to my manager with a smile. I realize later that the piece of paper is his phone number. When I come back from my lunch, I am asked by my manager to go into the storage unit behind the restaurant and grab cases of soda to restock the fridge. I agree and head back. This storage unit was basically a metal shipping carrier that was in the parking lot behind the restaurant. There was one big heavy metal door to get in and no light on the inside. While I was in there, I had my back turned to the metal door while I was knelt down looking for all the cases of soda on the shelves. Hey. My heart nearly stops, and I let out a sharp squeak of terror and quickly turn around to see him. I chuckle half-heartedly to try and make it seem like I wasn't on the verge of passing out and just quickly ask, Am I in your way? Silence. I slowly stand up and brace my back against the wall of the shipping container, slowly realizing that I may not be in the safest position right now. You never texted me. He slowly starts to move towards me, and I half cry, half shout, I, I have a boyfriend. Dead silence again. He simply slams his fist into the shipping carrier door and walks out without a word. His shift ended one hour later. Mine was set to end in another five hours. He seemed to have left, and I got through the rest of my shift almost completely without incident. I notice the car in the parking lot of the restaurant going out through the entrance and think, How stupid, why would they go that way? The car goes towards the intersection and U-turns to be driving the same way I'm walking. At this point, it's about 10.30pm. I had just finished closing up and began walking towards my bus stop, only about a mile away at the train station. As I am walking, I stay on the phone with my godmother and walk along to the train station. As I reach my stop, I realize that there is a car that keeps circling. I had noticed it while I was walking from my job, but thought that it must just be because I was on a straight road for so long. And when I notice the lift badge on it, I assume it's just someone looking for their passenger. I know that it can be dangerous waiting at night by myself since the trains had already stopped running that night and I had another 30 or so minutes before my bus would arrive. I keep pepper spray and a small switchblade as well as a whistle in my backpack for this exact reason. I place my backpack down next to me on the bench and pop in one of my earbuds so I can have my playlist queued up and ready to go when the bus arrives. Fifteen more minutes go by and I see the car circle again. Another 10 minutes and it pulls up directly in front of me. I take out my earbud to preemptively say, I'm not your passenger, sorry. The window on the car rolls down and I see him. Get in. He demands quickly. I'm dumbfounded and freeze. Uh, no thank you, my bus will be here soon. He smiles eerily. Don't you see who it is? You know me, get in. I tense up. No, I really don't want to. Please leave me alone. My voice is shaking and breaking on every word. I reach slowly from my backpack and freeze. Get in the car! I feel my entire body lock up and I want to scream but nothing comes out. I hear his door unlock and I start to panic thinking this is going to end very badly for me. My bus pulls in and I see the driver door of his car slam shut and peels off down the road in a hurry. I run onto the bus and quickly take the closest seat to the driver I possibly could. As soon as I get through the door of my room and see my boyfriend, I burst into tears and sob. I was shaking the entire bus ride with the realization that he had followed me in his car for a mile to the bus stop and then circled and waited until I was completely alone. I felt so ashamed that I had all the tools I believed I needed to keep myself safe and I had froze. I went to the police the next day and was told that even though they agreed it was extremely concerning and he could escalate further that they couldn't do anything until he flat out stated he intends to hurt me or stalk me for at least 48 hours. 
I was completely devastated but also determined to stay away from him in that place. I quit over text the next day because I was not about to go in person. I live in a house on a cul-de-sac with my mom, two brothers, and a roommate. I work two part-time jobs, one of which is in the same office my mom works at. She's a doctor and I work with medical records. I'm 20. My brothers, who are twins, are 17. My mom is 57 and the roommate is 18. We also live very close to a volunteer firehouse that blares an extremely loud alarm when there is an emergency. Everyone within a couple of miles can hear the alarm. We're middle class and live in a modest house, but have a large front yard because our driveway is super long. Seven years ago we moved into our house and for a while everything was chill, until we found out about our crazy neighbor, who I'll call Bob for privacy reasons. Bob has extremely paranoid schizophrenia and legitimately believes that the government is after him. He thinks that people are trying to brainwash him via microwaves and he freaks out whenever he hears a plane pass by because he thinks they're after him. Whenever the firehouse blares the alarm, Bob calls the police because he thinks someone is coming after him, and every time they have to tell him that he can't do that. He has also made some odd comments about one of my brothers as well. For a few years we didn't hear much from him until one day, he sent a letter in the mail trying to sell us his baseball cards for one million dollars. Apparently he sent the same letter to everyone else in the cul-de-sac. Everyone discarded the letters. All our neighbors are aware of Bob. They thought he was just a little crazy, but mainly harmless. We thought so too. We were wrong. Last winter we began to find mysterious footprints in the snow. It was a human's footprints across the front yard of the house. We knew it wasn't any of our footprints because none of us walked so far out into that part of our front yard like that. As I said earlier, our front yard is very large. We just shrugged it off as something odd. For a while, Bob hadn't bothered us, and we weren't thinking much of him at the time. Flash forward to a few days ago. Police were at Bob's house. Apparently he's being evicted. We kind of breathed a sigh of relief because he was weird but didn't think much of it. The next day after that was a normal day. Nothing odd. That was until Bob showed up at work. He began to rant to everyone about how he's in the military before going to my mom's secretary, asking to have lab work done on him. This was raising a bunch of red flags because my mom never told him where she worked. Not only that, but to find my mom's secretary, you'd have to go back behind the main row of secretaries. Each doctor has their own secretary and there are about 15 secretaries total, each with their own desk, into a smaller area where a large printer is. My mom's secretary is in that smaller area and it should be impossible for a stranger who hasn't been there before to know where she was. How did Bob know where to find my mom's secretary and ask for my mom, despite not ever being there before, and my mom never telling him her name? This freaked us out and we decided to do some research on Bob. It turns out his dad was ex-military and that Bob owns a bunch of firearms. Bob's shady behavior towards my mom and showing up at our work could only mean one thing. This man is stalking us, and he is dangerous. At the very least, we have begun to suspect that he has been going through our mail. It was also likely that it was his footprints that were in the snow of our yard last winter. My mom got a peace order, it's kind of like a restraining order, rather quickly, and then notified all the other neighbors about what happened. We thought maybe things would die down now, but nope. Today he was in the parking lot of work, staring blankly at one of the secretaries. She said he was sweating and looked a little off. He didn't stop staring at her. He asked about my mom again. Everyone in the family is on edge. He has guns, has been stalking my mom at work and is being evicted. He doesn't have much to lose if he did some dangerous stuff to us. We notify the police and are making sure to lock the doors and install security cameras so that we can see if he comes onto the property again. No one is allowed home alone until the craziness stops and until we know for a fact that we'll be safe.
My first year of college was my first step out of my hometown. I was always a tad bit shy, but being away from home and surrounded by strangers made me much worse. One or two girls in my dorm had introduced themselves and we became good friends, but they would remain the only people I'd speak to for several months. This was until I met Brian. He was also a freshman and a big introvert like me. We hit it off quickly and were dating within a month. He was into anime and Japanese culture big time. Probably the biggest weeaboo in the school, but he treated me well for a while. Things started to change when we had been together for about six months. We were talking about our favorite movies when he realized none of mine were anime. He got very angry and started berating me for it. I was shocked by this behavior. He'd never acted this way toward me before. He was calling me a liar and a fake, saying I tricked him into going out with him. This didn't make any sense to me. I never told him, not once, that I liked anime. I think he just assumed I would like it because I was of Japanese descent. I realize now that's probably why he introduced himself to me in the first place. His yelling and name calling upset me so much I ran off to my room to hide. I wouldn't hear from him again until he sent me a text a few days later. In it, he said he wanted to see me in person so he could apologize face to face. And like an idiot, I agreed. When I got to the library, his apology quickly devolved into another yelling session. He was nice and quiet at first, like usual, but he began getting more and more angry as he talked, and things went downhill fast. Like before, I fled back to the safety of my room and stayed there for a couple of weeks, except for when I went to class. Thankfully, I'd forgotten to tell him my class schedule. Multiple times over those weeks, I got texts apologizing for his behavior, sometimes more than one a day but I learned my lesson and ignored them. Once he realized I wasn't going to contact him he began trying to see me at my dorm. The other girls did a good job keeping him away but finally one day he wouldn't take no for an answer and we had to call the campus police to make him leave. That night the other girls in the dorm came to my room and voiced their concerns about him. The consensus seemed to be that they were all afraid for not only my safety but also for their own. They recommended I file a restraining order against him. So the next day, along with a few of the girls from the rugby team, I went to the campus police office to file the order. Since I occasionally ventured off of campus, the officers suggested I also go to the city police and file another order with them, and so I did. The seriousness of all this was becoming overwhelming. Without the support of my friends, I'm not sure I would have survived it at all. The following day, he must have been notified of my filings. I received almost ten text messages from him running the gamut of sincere apologies to actual death threats. I emailed the messages to both the police agencies and they said to keep in touch with them and to call 911 if he tried to contact me again in person. Me ignoring his messages must have bothered them so much that he was willing to risk jail because a couple of days later, he showed up at my dorm. He was likely headed for my room, but was spotted before he made it to my floor. The campus police caught him and eventually turned him over to the city police. After spending the night in jail, he was released. Later that afternoon, he was sent a message to report to the dean's office. The stalking and subsequent arrest had reached some of those higher up at the university, and they were brought into a meeting to hear his side. At the end of the hour-long meeting, it was decided... To kick him out. He was told to be off the campus grounds by 9 p.m. that evening, and to my amazement, he did as he was told for once. That was the last time I saw him. Of course, he had to send me one more angry text message on his way out of town, but I was so happy that he was leaving, his words didn't bother me at all. The charges against him were eventually dropped. They were contingent upon him leaving town and never contacting me again. I'm overjoyed to say that he's kept his side of the bargain. My only remaining concerns are for the next poor girl he may set his sights on. Hopefully he learned his lesson and there won't be a next time. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit. R Let's Read Official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. 
and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.